Hi, I'm Dave Vickers and welcome to The Photo Show. In today's episode, we're going to do the fourth part of our basic photography course. In the last two episodes, we've been looking at parts of the exposure triangle and we've been focusing on shutter speed and aperture. And in this episode, we're going to look at the third part of the exposure triangle, the ISO. If you've missed any of the previous episodes, I'll put a link up here so you can catch up with those. To start off with, what is ISO or ISO? Now there's two ways of saying it, but it is actually an acronym. It actually stands for International Organization of Standardization. You can see why they decided on ISO. Now the International Organization of Standardization is based in Geneva and its job is to set a standard for calibrations and measurements in various different fields. One of those fields happens to be photography. So the term ISO in photography is used to dictate the light sensitivity of the film or image sensor. In film photography, film is available in various stages of ISO. Typical ranges would be 50 ISO, 100 ISO, 200 ISO, 400 ISO, 800 ISO, 1600 ISO and 3200 ISO. They were pretty much the standard ISO range of films available. And what the ISO number there refers to is how sensitive to light that particular type of film was. Now in film photography, this was achieved by the different crystal sizes in the chemical makeup that was put onto the actual film. In a lower ISO film, say ISO 100, the crystals in the chemicals were very, very small and fine, and therefore reacted slower to light. As you moved up to say ISO 400 or ISO 800, the crystal sizes in the chemical makeup were larger and therefore reacted faster to light. This gave rise to the term of what's called film speed. So a film of ISO 100 was a reasonably slow film speed. A film ISO of 400, 800, 1600, etc. was a faster film speed. Because that was how they reacted to light. The lower the ISO, the slower they reacted to light. Therefore, that was called film speed. The difference in the crystal sizes on the various film speeds meant that when the film was developed, you had a different texture with each type of film. A negative from a film with a slow speed, say ISO 100, with very small crystal sizes, produced a very smooth, clean looking image. The faster film you used, and therefore the larger the crystal size, when this was developed, would then produce what is called film grain. And this could be desirable in a lot of black and white images. And you've probably often seen this being used in a very artistic way. The crystal size of the film gave a graining on the image, which often gave it a very stylized look. So that was how ISO operated on light sensitive film. The size of the crystals on the film dictated the speed of the film. Now one of the disadvantages with film photography is you could only shoot the ISO of the film that you had installed in the camera. If you put a roll of ISO 100 film in your camera, you could only shoot that roll at ISO 100. There were exceptions, but you had to shoot the entire roll of film at the same settings. Moving on to digital photography, the way it works in a modern camera now is that your image sensor is made more or less sensitive to light. And this is calibrated to tie in with the same way that film photography was. So therefore, on a modern digital camera, you will have an ISO range. On a modern digital camera, the ISO range is typically something like ISO 100 up to something like ISO 12800. Once again, there are exceptions. There are some cameras that will shoot a slightly lower ISO and some cameras that will go a much higher ISO. But typically, we'll stick within the range of ISO 100 to ISO 12800. And as I was saying with the modern digital camera, the way this works is the image sensor is made more or less sensitive to light. Now with ISO, each increment you step up or down effectively halves or doubles the light sensitivity. And this is typically known in photography as a stop. We'll look at this in more detail later on, but if you ever hear someone refer to up one stop or down one stop, what they're referring to is effectively halving or doubling the amount of light. So basically, ISO 100 is half as sensitive to light as ISO 200, and ISO 400 is twice as sensitive to light as ISO 200. Now, I understand this may be getting a bit confusing, so what I'll do is simplify it down. In a previous episode, I was saying about using a seesaw or a balance scale as your way of visualizing how to get a correct exposure. And in that, I was saying that the ISO is basically your pivot point. And it is. What I'd like you to think of is your ISO being your baseline. This is where you start with when you're trying to get the correct exposure for your photography. 
and it's all going to depend on the lighting conditions in which you're working in. For example, if you're working outside in bright sunlight and there's plenty of light, you're going to want a lower ISO number, say ISO 100 to ISO 200. If then you're working in the shade or you've come indoors during a bright day, you want to up your ISO sensitivity, somewhere between ISO 200 and ISO 400. If you're working indoors in the evening in lower light and you want to use the flash on your camera, somewhere between ISO 400 and ISO 800 will work. If you're working indoors with much lower light, ISO 800 to ISO 1600. If you're working indoors at say a sporting event or a concert, ISO 1600 to ISO 3200 will work well. And if you're working in very low light, ISO 3200 and above will help you because each time you increase your ISO, you're making your sensor more sensitive to light than it was on the previous setting. So therefore, ISO is kind of your baseline setting. Look at the lighting situation you have available, set your ISO, then all of your other settings will be dictated from your ISO setting. So that would be the reason that you change your ISO settings, very much dependent on the lighting conditions that you have available when you're photographing. Now one of the great advantages of digital photography over film photography is, is that you can change your ISO settings between shots. With film photography, if you loaded your camera with 100 ISO film, you would need to shoot that entire roll of film as it is at ISO 100. With digital photography, we have the advantage that each frame can be shot at a different ISO. You could shoot one frame outside in bright sunlight at 100 ISO, immediately move back inside to a very low light situation, change the ISO up to ISO 800 and take another shot. That is something you could not do with film photography. With film photography, you were very much stuck with the ISO of the film that you'd loaded in the camera. With digital photography, you have the ability to change the ISO from one shot to another. Now there is a payoff with digital photography in using the higher ISO settings. As I was explaining with film photography, the ISO was dictated by the crystal size or grain within the film. And therefore, the higher ISO you were using, the more visible the grain was within the finished image. Now, there is something very similar with digital photography. The higher ISO you use, the more digital noise it introduced. And this comes in the form of a speckling or graining within the image. And it's because where the sensor is being made more sensitive to light, there's more interference in the finished image coming across as this speckling or digital noise within the finished image. So once again, as with film, the lower the ISO number, the cleaner the image is going to look. An image shot at ISO 100 will be very clear and clean with very little digital noise. An image shot at 6400 ISO will have digital noise. Now the amount of digital noise will vary from camera to camera, but we'll look at that in more detail in a further episode. So as a general rule of thumb, you want to try and use the lowest ISO that the lighting conditions will allow. And this will give you the best quality image with the least amount of digital noise. There we go. That's a simple explanation of what ISO is and how it works within your camera. In the next episode, we'll be looking at exposure and we'll explain how you start to put these three elements together, shutter speed, aperture and ISO, to create the correct exposure to get the photographs you want. For now, I'm Dave Vickers. This is The Photo Show. Please stay safe and well. Till the next time, see you then.